Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Show, where we talk about health tips and strategies to help you be smart, sexy, and strong. On today's show, I have as my guest, Dr. Donnie Wilson. Dr. Donnie is an award-winning naturopathic doctor and midwife. For nearly 20 years, she has helped women, men, and children overcome health challenges and achieve wellness goals with individualized strategies that address the whole body and the underlying cause of health issues. Dr. Donnie is creator of the Hamptons Cleanse. She has written a column for the Huffington Post helping to demystify sugar and nutrition and is author of The Stress Remedy, Master Your Body Synergy and Optimize Your Health, as well as the best-selling ebook, Stress Remedies, How to Reduce Stress and Boost Your Health in Just 15 Minutes a Day. On today's show, we talk about the role sugar plays on our health. Dr. Donnie shares hidden sources of sugar, how sugar affects us, specific tests to talk with your doctor about, and how we can break free from sugar addictions. And by the way, sugar addictions are more common than you think. So please enjoy this interview. On today's show, I have as my guest, Dr. Donnie Wilson. So great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're going to talk today about sugar, right? We've got a lot of people have questions about sugar, the dreaded sugar. So, you know, is we hear that it's bad for us, but let's talk about that. Why is it bad for us? Oh, that yeah, that's the real question, right? Because sometimes too, people, a lot of patients will ask me that. You know, what is it so bad about sugar? And First of all, just knowing that we're talking about really like added sugars, like, you know, the, a spoonful of white sugar is especially the part that can, can add up to be bad for you, especially your quantities. And the reason it's bad is because it, especially we think about the long-term health uh, issues associated with a high intake of sugar, so diabetes, uh, heart disease. Uh, even cancer has been associated with high intake of sugar, as well as, you know, things that you might notice day to day, like weight gain and mood changes or sleep issues. Um, and so, you know, even headaches, digestive issues, you know, so there could be affecting you even day to day, but then there's the long term that is also involved. Right. And it also can speed up the aging process physically, right? I mean, we got a lot of internal things going on, blood sugar imbalances, weight gain, diabetes, a lot of risk there and cancer you mentioned, but also physically things, it shows up in our skin and the aging process, right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, it's really that you know, our, our bodies have only a certain ability to manage sugar at any one point in time. Um, and I think sometimes that really helps clarify because we wish we could just take in, you know, eat a bunch of sugar and have our body spread it out over the next week or over the next month. But it doesn't. Our bodies have to, as soon as you swallow it, your body has to do something with it. And, you know, a little bit your body can deal with and process it and use it for energy. We need carbohydrates and sugar for energy. So it's not that we want to do with zero. You need a little bit. It's just that it's so easy to overdo it. And when we have too much, more than our body can handle at that moment in time, that's when it starts to, the body has to put it somewhere. So I, I joke, I'm like, it's going to put it on your hips, around your waist, or it's like you're saying, it's going to put it on cells in your body that can be, you know, related to the aging process, eyesight, wrinkles, um, all of that can be associated with just extra sugar that your body had to do something with. Right. Okay. And so let's talk about sugar. What is sugar? <laughs> what are the many names of sugar? What are the various ways that we can get sugar? It's sneaky. I mean, that's the other bad thing about sugar is it's very sneaky. You know, you can even be watching labels on packaging and still have it sneak past you because it has many names. It, there, it can come under at least 10 different names, everything from evaporated cane juice and beet sugar and, you know, malt sugar, sucrose, maltose. 
Um, there's there's so many names, and, and one secret is to look for the letters O S E because any any chemical name of sugar is going to have O S E at the end, like sucrose, fructose, maltose. Those are all sugars, um, but it doesn't always say that on the label. So you want to be careful uh, to watch for it. But if you all of those will register if you're looking at a package, it'll show under sugar on the label. And then the key is to look down in the ingredients and go, okay, what is that sugar coming from? Because a sugar on a package label could be from a fruit. I mean, there may be cherries or dates in that. And that might be okay, a little bit of a fruit, right? We want to have some, some healthy fruit intake every day. But if you look down at the ingredients and you end up seeing some other form of something that if, even if you can't pronounce it or you don't know what it is, it might be a sugar. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of my patients, they, they shop at health food stores and they, they, they say, oh, I just found this. It tastes really great. And then yeah. I, I ask them, okay, have you looked at the ingredient label? Have you looked closely to see how much sugar is in it? And just because it says it's a health food or it's natural or organic or gluten-free or, you know, whatever it is and yeah. It doesn't mean that it's it's going to be necessarily healthy for you because of the sugar content. And then there are all these smoothie drinks that are full of fruit, but it has, starts to add up. If you look at the sugar content on some of those, some of them yes. are more than a Coca-Cola. Exactly. You, and that's that's exactly it. If it tastes really good, you better look twice is what I my rule <laughs> because I figure they must have put something sweet in there. Now some they do there are ways to make things sweet that are a little better, like stevia, for example, is an herb that's sweet. So it's a plant that's sweet. So it doesn't actually trigger insulin. It doesn't have actual sugar in it. But some there is some um, thinking there as well that you want to moderate your stevia intake even because it still gives you a sweet taste. And how much is that then sort of creating a pattern of wanting more sweet? But at the same time, if you are going to choose and you look at the packaging and it says stevia, that's better than having it be high fructose corn syrup, which we haven't talked about that quite yet. Yeah. So let's talk about high fructose corn syrup. Why is that so bad? So here we're talking about fructose. Again, it ends with O-S-E. So it's a sugar. It's a, when it's fructose, it's from generally from a fruit or vegetable fructose. Like you were saying, even in fruit juices or veggie juices, sometimes the sugar content is very high because it contains fructose, which in that form is still a natural sugar, but it can still get to be too much, as much as in a soda. Or, and, and so you have to really be careful about juices. With a high fructose corn syrup, what they've done is they've concentrated the fructose because it makes it really nice and sweet. The problem is that, see, fructose doesn't trigger insulin. Insulin is what manages our sugar and glucose levels. Fructose doesn't have to have an insulin response, but it still is a stress on our body. It still has to be processed by the liver, and it still can increase these health issues, the diabetes, the cancer, and the aging. So we still have to be careful of fructose as a sugar, even though it doesn't trigger insulin. And that's the problem with high fructose corn syrup. It's also often added to these packaged foods. So you go in thinking you're choosing a healthy gluten-free packaged food and lo and behold, it might have a high fructose corn syrup or sweetener in it, which ends up pushing up your sugar and carbohydrate intake. Even though it's gluten-free, it might be high carb. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and high fructose corn syrup is in sodas, most sodas, right? Most sodas, unless it's a, a diet soda, then they're using artificial sweeteners, right? So they're using a chemical sweetener, which is also not a great option because we know it's amazing, actually. You would think that here you are choosing an artificial sweetener like aspartame, and maybe it's it's not sugar, so it shouldn't it should cut out this diabetes risk. But the research is actually saying that that's not true. That even the artificial sweeteners still have. Uh, ri health risk associated with them. So it, it really, you don't want to be choosing these sweet beverages, you know, no matter how we try to get around it, you know, whether it's real sugar or artificial sweeteners, it's still a health risk. So you're going to be much better off choosing water, 
herbal teas without sweeteners. You know, maybe we want to talk about what to choose instead. Right. Well, let's first talk about, you said that some sugar is okay. And mm -hmm. so how do people know if they're getting too much sugar? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I was looking at this again because, and it's, you know, one thing is, is that, you know, it's kind of like confronting the facts, right? It's like sometimes we wish we were like robots for our bodies and we could kind of determine how much is okay. But we are in human bodies and our bodies do have only a certain ability to deal with sugars and other things in our environment as well. And especially as women, our ability to manage sugar is less than men. So a lot of times when you hear about how much sugar we can have, it's based on men. Men can have, uh, you know, say, they say 40 grams of sugar. I still even think that's on the high side. 40 grams is about equivalent to 10 teaspoons a day of sugar. Can you imagine? Wow, that's a lot. Spoonfuls of sugar. But for women, it's 25 grams, which is just about six teaspoons. So to know that, you know, we just have to kind of go, okay, I get it. I need to have no more than six teaspoons. Now, would you rather that as six spoonfuls of sugar or would you rather that as that's actually less than a soda because a soda has about 10 teaspoons of sugar in it? You've already gone over if you have one soda. So is it would you rather use up your sugar for the day as part of a soda or would you rather use it on some fruits and vegetables and natural sugars? And I think if we start to think of it that way, we can start to go, okay, how do I want to spend my sugar numbers each day, so to speak? You know, let me make a choice about it. And the more you really understand where it is and what the potential risks are, I think it's easier to make those choices. And then you'll also know when you go over. I mean, the more you start to get awareness for this, usually you can kind of feel when you've gone over your six teaspoons a day. Because if you're regularly having less sugar, when you do have more, you're more likely to have your energy change, you know, either feeling... Uh, anxious or then after eating sugar a couple hours later you feel tired or mood changes or sleep changes or maybe your weight changes a little bit and your clothes are fitting different and you know so all of a sudden you're like hey what's going on oh I had a little more sugar or for some system you know I see that I'll, I found that a lot for myself if I have a little too much sugar I'm much more likely to catch that next cold or get that sore throat or sinus congestion. So it could really be a lot of little things you can start to pick up on that tell you that you had too much. Yeah, those are all really good points. And and also there are, have been there have been studies showing that sugar suppresses the immune system and even as little as like what like a soda or less than a not even a whole soda, if you drink that it significantly suppresses your immune system. Yeah, which is why I think a lot of times we see people more often getting sick around the holidays. You know, we tend to get more, even in the summer during barbecue season or events and holiday weekends, you you consume maybe a little more sugar. And, and then there's alcohol, which comes with usually some sugar as well as alcohol, which is also a stress to your sugar metabolism. And you're way more likely to get sick the next few days. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you mentioned the, the number of teaspoons and it's when, when you think about measuring that out, like you're making, you know, a cake or something, six teaspoons, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it kind of sounds like a lot, but, yeah. but it, it is hidden in so many foods. So it's hard to think of it in a teaspoon because you even get sugar from fruits and vegetables, um, condiments, yeah. salad dressings juice, all kinds of ways that you can get sugar. So oh definitely something for to, to be aware of, right? It's so true. Actually, uh, when you mentioned the condiments, it, it always amazes me when I pick up a container of ketchup or mustard and right there, one of the first ingredients is sugar. And it's, you just start to realize, wait a minute, do I, I don't want my sugar in my condiments you know? <laughs> or even your salad dressing, you know, you can find them that it doesn't have it in there. So better to look on the shelves, pick up each container and see if it lists sugar on there. And if it does get a different one. 
Right. And even breads and crackers and and yeah. you know, some people will get coconut milk or almond milk and there's oftentimes sugar added to those to make them taste better. So yeah, just keep reading those ingredient labels. And you know, sugar is an addictive substance. So let's let's talk about that. I'm sure you're aware of the study on rats that were given a choice between cocaine and sugar. Um, yes, and that they chose the sugar over the cocaine. So let's talk about sugar as an addiction. Yeah, it really is. And, I, and it's when you start trying to decrease it that I think you, it'll usually you really become aware of how addictive it is because you next thing you know, it goes by and you're like, oh, my energy's down or my head, I'm getting a little headache. Where's that sugar? And so it, it, it really is, you, you can, it is so addictive because at first when you eat it, it feels good. You know, you're, you get a little dopamine release and your mood goes up, your energy goes up. So in order to really kick this, this habit of sugar, we're going to need to think through that and plan ahead. What can you have, what can you have around to choose instead? Because it's in those moments when you're tired and it's late at night and you're, you know, that's when you're going to tend to want to go towards sugar. So you want to have other options around. I always recommend trying to go for protein. Really try to put that message in your head that it's like, if you start to feel like your sugar, blood sugar is dropping, instead of going for sugar, go for something with protein in it. Not that you would have only protein, or I mean, we don't want too much protein either, but it's a good way to just start to break that habit and change it. If you can go, okay, let me go for some nuts or some, you know, maybe it's, you know, time for some turkey or chicken or, you know, some or even a protein shake that's going to give you some protein instead because what you'll be amazed is that when you have protein, it actually will help you recover your energy and your mood and, and so then you can keep going the next few hours and not be thinking constantly about the sugar. Um, the other um, thing you can try is to pick a favorite tea. You know, if it's green tea, green tea is great at balancing blood sugar levels. So that would be a perfect solution because then you're going to be much less likely to experience the ups and downs of, of the sugar and less likely to crave the sugar. So you can do green tea or if, if it could be any other kind of, you know, herbal tea that you enjoy. So as soon as you start to feel like where's that sweet beverage, instead you can go to this herbal tea you enjoy and may actually have other uh, you know, benefits that you're looking for, for energy or for mood or stress relief or digestive. And you end up just choosing that instead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So protein, eating a little protein can be helpful. And that could be at mealtime or it could be snacks, right? So what other tips do you have to help people breaking that, that sugar habit? Because it is really a, a challenge for people. Yeah. Yeah. You want to have those, those options available to you. So like if you're at work or you're in a car or you're on a trip on an airplane, make sure you have something in your desk, in your bag so that, you know, cause you know, you're going to need to eat every few hours. Our, you know, it, our bodies really, again, we need some carbohydrate and we need protein and healthy fats every few hours. That I usually say try not to go more than four hours without eating because by the time you go past four hours without eating, your body is going to need some um, glucose, some healthy sugar for your brain function from somewhere. And if you're not going to, it's not going to be from your food, then our bodies tend to increase our cortisol levels and, um, and burn our muscle tissue to create more sugar for our body. So you don't want that either. You don't, you don't want to have, you know, muscle loss and high cortisol levels because what happens then is, Say you, say you skip a meal and you just power through and you're like, okay, I'm going to get to my food in another couple hours. So your body's raising its cortisol and, and, and just trying to get through. Then when you finally do eat and you, you might choose carbs or sugar at that point, your body is more likely then to turn that sugar into weight gain and aging processes and stress on your liver than it would have been if you didn't skip that meal. So it, you know, it is important to, it's one of those things, it's not a, a, a black or white, you know, don't have any, it's a matter of how do we do it in a way that best supports our body's metabolism. So you, if you can choose some healthy balance of, 
of carbohydrates. Now, in, in term, when I say carbohydrates, instead of straight sugar, we can choose something like a, a more whole grain, even if it's gluten-free, uh, brown rice, quinoa, or nuts have healthy carbs in them as well. So you can have your carb with your protein and healthy fat and in a small quantity, and then just make sure you have that with you so you can repeat that when it's been another four hours so that it doesn't go too long and have this stress signal go out. Yeah, and and while we're sleeping, it's different. We don't have to wake up and every four hours while we're sleeping, but we're not moving around. We're not expending energy. We do burn some calories while we're sleeping, but it's not much. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. Then your your our bodies also need that break. You know, you go to sleep and we know we need seven and a half to nine hours of sleep and you want to be able to have that you stay asleep that whole time. And, and our bodies actually need that break from eating. There's some research that really is starting to show how we do need that time from not eating. But then, you know, during the day when you're, you know, you're busy and you're active and you're, or you've been exercising, you know, that's when we need to feed our bodies to keep our blood sugar balanced. And actually what's interesting, I think, is that the more we keep our blood sugar balanced throughout the day, the better we sleep. You know, it's when you skip meals and have high sugar or high carb meals that you end up being more likely to wake up in the middle of the night because your body is just off track. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you also put people on a sugar detox, right? Do you have a, a program that you do with people? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I mean, sometimes it's in addition to some other factors like helping to balance blood sugar levels overall and helping to avoid food allergens at the same time. But, you know, helping to detox or eliminate sugar is such an important part, I think, in the beginning of, of for most health issues. Because as we've talked about, as soon as the sugar intake decreases and people can start to learn where is the sugar, how can I choose and eat foods and drink beverages that are not high sugar, all of a sudden everything else starts working better. Hormones come back into balance. Um, even um, hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those hormones come back into balance too. They're all affected by sugar intake. So it's not a separate thing. It's so integrated into your whole health that I really consider it a first step in the healing process. If we can get the, the sugar intake decreased and the blood sugar level balanced, then we're already getting better cortisol levels, hormone levels, even thyroid function, and digestion. Because that sugar, high sugar intake can really throw off the digestion. So if you want to be like improving your immune system, your digestion, your hormones, um, and your nervous system or your mood, all in one step, then decreasing your sugar is it makes it only makes sense. I call it multitasking, right? You do one thing and you get old. Might as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and and I it, it's so true that sugar is a a big issue. And I you know again I have to go back to the addiction. It's not that easy though for people. And so wow. how long does it take to did that you find that it takes to kind of get to the point? where you could say, you know, I don't really want sugar that much anymore and just turn it, turn away from that chocolate cake or and make healthier options. What, how long does, do you find that it takes for people? It's a good question. For some people, it's a little faster than for others. You really want to touch, you know, pay attention to yourself and your body and, and take it at your speed. This is not just a one size fits all process. This is, uh, it's important to do it to be successful. I think we need to do it in a way that fits for you. And, um, you know, so, so you might find that I would say, especially the first week is the hardest. You know, people always tell me, you know, that the first few days and the first week is always the hardest because you're trying to find different solutions. And at the same time, you're experiencing some of the, withdrawal of not having that sugar there. So you're more likely to feel irritable and tired and, you know, that first week. But then after that, most people start to feel the difference, especially if they've really been able to reduce their sugar intake, the body will notice, your body will get the memo, so to speak, and go, oh, 
something's different. There's less sugar. We can do things differently here, but it does take the body, you know, a little time. Some people, it takes a few days for their body to notice something's different and they start to really see a difference quickly. Other people, it may take a few weeks or even a couple months for the body to go, wait a minute, hey, I can do these hormones differently. And it may also depend on for how long you've had a sugar, high sugar intake. You know, if your sugar intake has been high for a while, it may take a little time to notice the change. It can also on your insulin function. We were talking a little bit about insulin. Again, insulin is the hormone. When, when we eat really any carbohydrate breaks down to a form of sugar called glucose in our bloodstream. And it's insulin's job to move that glucose from the blood into our cells. And it's in the cells where you really want it. You want the glucose to get into your cells where your body can use it for energy. And so this function, this insulin function we talk about is really important. If your insulin is functioning well, then any carbs or sugar, you know, this, the, you know, I mean, if you ate a whole lot, you can at a certain point overwhelm your insulin. But if you you know, if you have good insulin function, your body is going to use that sugar for good reason, good for good purposes. And when the insulin function decreases, and at the extreme, that looks like diabetes, right? When insulin is just not able to handle sugar anymore. So if the insulin function is starting to be less effective, it may be a little hard. You have to stick with this change a little longer before you really start to see the benefit, where you start to see your blood sugar levels decreasing, and your hemoglobin is another blood test we use to help us understand blood sugar levels that increase, and you start to feel better, but that may take three to six months if you've been, if you already had started to get, you know, some lower insulin function happening. Okay, so people want to talk to their doctors about um, which, which tests to have. You talk mm -hmm. about fasting, blood sugar, you've mentioned hemoglobin A1C, um, mm -hmm. and insulin. So what about, so those are the tests that you think people should talk to their doctor about that, to see if they have problems with insulin or high blood sugar? Yeah, and that's one of the main reasons when you get your blood drawn, like an annual blood work done, when you go in fasting in the morning to have your blood drawn, one of the main reasons is so that we can see what is your blood sugar having not eaten anything? And if it's a little high, it means that the insulin function is decreased and it's allowing the blood sh sugar to stay in the blood too long. That's what you don't want because sugar in the blood that's staying too long means that it's going to cause the aging process, it's going to cause weight gain, it's going to increase cholesterol levels. So that's what we don't want. And that's why you have that fasting blood sugar level measured that way. The hemoglobin A1C I think of it as your average blood sugar over three months. So it's, it's helpful to see that because it, we may not catch it on a single blood draw, but if we can see what your average blood sugar is over three months, it gives us a sense of, hey, are there some days or certain times when your blood sugar is a little high? And this way you can kind of see the average. There's another test called fructosamine, and sometimes that one is done as well, fructosamine. And that can too of do you have times when your blood sugar levels are running a little bit on the high side but I usually find that between the fasting glucose and the hemoglobin A1c that gives us a good sense insulin now when you test insulin in the blood we want it to be low and if we start to see that the insulin level in the blood is high it means that your body's working really hard to try to move that sugar and we don't want that. We want your body to not have to work so hard. <laughs> so we need to decrease the sugar intake and make it easier. Let your body make less insulin so it doesn't wear itself out. So one thing I, that's all, those are all great points and labs that I, that I definitely like to run with my patients. And one of the things though that surprises people is they've been told your blood sugar is fine. But when I look at it, what you know the numbers are below 100 is considered normal but that's not exactly optimal is it yeah yeah you have to you have you want to watch it over time you know i i always recommend that you know that patients save their lab results and even chart it out for yourself what was your fasting glucose 5 years ago and four years ago and now what was what is it now so you can start to see if there's a trend upward trend 
that already can alert you, hey, I need to pay more attention here. Or even if it's getting anywhere near 100, you know, above 90, you start to go, wait a minute here, I don't want that. I mean, so you can, or even if it's too low, actually, sometimes if it's, you know, say it's 60, that starts to tell me, hey, wait a minute, this, it's not a high blood sugar, but I can tell that the metabolism is stressed because we also don't want low blood sugar happening. And amazingly, the treatment is the same. When you're having low blood sugar, what we do is we start to watch out for high sugar intake and make sure that you're having regular consistent meals through the day so that your body's never dipping low in that blood sugar level. Great. Yeah. Good points. And and what about nutritional consider other con- nutritional considerations for for cutting, you know, getting down your um, sugar intake and getting away from that sugar addiction? Mm-hmm. Other nutritional considerations to to look into. Well, if you really, when you hear about like a whole food diet, that's probably, if you just even decided to, I'm going to follow a whole food diet, you're automatically going to be decreasing your sugar intake because so much of those sneaky sugars we were talking about come in in packaged foods. They get added as an ingredient and you didn't realize it. You didn't approve it. It's just there. So when you, when we say whole foods, we mean like the actual fruit or vegetable, the actual piece of broccoli, the actual berries, um, the protein sources, like whether it's vegetarian proteins or or non-vegetarian protein sources that you actually got the whole food, not from a package that you opened. Although there are situations where, you know, I always like to say, you know, it's sometimes if you if you live alone and you you need to have you know, your food in the freezer, you could have whole foods that come in a freezer, but you even have to kind of be careful with that because sometimes say it's a, you know, cooked frozen chicken breast, um, it, they still can add things to it. So you still have to be careful, even though it seems like it's just a chicken breast, you have to be careful. But, um, but you get the idea, you know, thinking of how can I choose something that wasn't already prepared and put into a package then you're automatically going to be decreasing your your sugar intake. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if there is one thing that you would recommend people do today to cut back on their sugar or to start moving away from a sugar addiction, what would that be? Well, let's see. I'm thinking just, you know, starting to pick up each thing you eat, pick it up, Pick up the label, pick up the, if it came from a package, pick up the package and just start getting curious, you know, start going, hey, what is in this anyway? You know, because sometimes we we stop looking, you know, we start to just kind of grab things because we eat it every day and we kind of lose track, you know, what actually was in there. Even if it's a protein bar, sugar is in a lot of protein bars in some form. It might not be actual sugar, but it might be. Sometimes it's honey and a little bit of honey is okay. Honey is a fructose. A little bit of honey you might be okay with. But just do a double check, you know. Just be willing to kind of get curious and say, hey, where is this sugar coming in? I mean, if you're a little analytical, you might want to pull out a post-it note and write down and add up for a day. Hey, how many grams of sugar am I getting? Am I getting 25 grams? Am I getting less than that or more than that? So you can just get a sense of it for you. And then you can start to make a goal for yourself. You can go, okay, if I say my goal is 25 grams and I, I just did a quick post-it note addition on my, what I ate today and it's more like 40, then you could say, hey, maybe I'm going to try to decrease by five grams each day. You know, what can I cut out tomorrow to drop me down to 35? And what can I cut out the next day to get me down to 30? And so you, it doesn't have to be like, you know, a hundred to zero. It doesn't have to be totally cold turkey. It can just be where you, you gain awareness and you start to look at your diet and you get curious and you get empowered about your health and your goal. And you go, okay, let me just see what I can do here. Can I get it down to 25? And then at the same time, if you're motivated to, I would journal about it. How am I feeling now? You know, what are the things you're noticing in your body right now? Are you more tired or irritable or sleep is a little bit off? And then start to make these sugar changes and then check back in with yourself next week. Okay, now, how am I feeling? 
because when we when you do that you really it becomes real it's not just some outside thing telling you you have to avoid sugar it's you taking it on for yourself and really realizing hey i feel better and that's what's most important is that if you feel better about your health and your future you're going to want to keep choosing for your health in your future because it's important to you and you feel better for it absolutely okay well thank you dr donnie Tell us how people can find you. Oh, you can find me. My website is drdonnie.com. It's it's spelled just D-R-D-O-N-I.com. So that's an easy way. Um, but I'm also in social media. So if you if you want to come on Facebook or Twitter, um, please join me there as well. Just as, again as Dr. Donnie Wilson. Yeah, and I I I follow you on Facebook and Twitter, and I repost some of your stuff sometimes. So yeah, you got some great great content up there. Thank you for all that you do to help people, help your patients, and help other people that maybe can't even get a chance to come see you. So thank you for all that you do. And likewise, thank you. Okay, great to have you on. Okay, see you soon. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Donnie Wilson. To learn more about Dr. Donnie, you can go to my website, drtrevorcates.com. Go to the podcast page with your interview, and you'll find all the links and information there. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the Spa Doctor podcast on iTunes or on my website so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. Also, if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend that you get your customized skin profile at theskinquiz.com. Based upon your answers, you'll get great tips on glowing skin and vibrant health. It only takes a few moments to do that, so I highly recommend you check it out. And also, don't miss any of our great posts on social media, Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter. Lots of great tips there as well. And you can join the conversation and ask questions. So thank you, and we'll see you next time. 